Hi, and welcome to Off the Beaten Tracks, the only show on YouTube where nothing you do with a fork is against the law. Welcome back to Off the Beaten Tracks. I'm Roxanne, and today we're talking to Jeff Jones of the band Ocean, who back in 1971 had a massive hit with the song Put Your Hand in the Hand on this album. Hi, Jeff. Hi there, Roxanne. It's great to have you here to talk about this album. Can you tell us a little bit about, well, I know that actually you were a very, very young child at the time. <laughs> well, I, I thought I was an adult, but I was actually fresh out of high school. Um, and uh, when we started recording the uh, record, I was still 16. And shortly after it was released in 1970, in fall of 70, I turned 17. <laughs> I had uh, my 17th birthday um, in Kitchener-Waterloo, opening for Bonnie and Delaney and Friends. Oh. Bonnie and Delaney Bramlett. Terrific. Um, uh, and I believe Dave Mason was subbing in on guitar with them that night. Like sometimes it was Eric Clapton and that night it was Dave Mason. Um, it was quite a night. When this group got together, apparently they, they got together in London, Ontario, and then came to Yorkville and the principals of the band went looking for a bass player and they found you. Yeah, um, essentially uh, Janice Morgan and Greg Brown um, had uh, been performing, working out of London as Leather and Lace. And it was kind of like a Holiday Inn show band type of thing, guy and a girl and uh, backing band kind of thing. And they, after doing that for a few years, determined that they wanted to record um, and uh, write and, and have a, a real career touring and get out of that circuit. So um, they had a guitarist, Dave Tamblin, that was a good friend also from London. And the three of them set out to get a rhythm section, a drummer and a bass player. And uh, they enlisted uh, Chuck Slater, who I had come to know um, in the recent months. And all, all of them were older than I was, but he took me around to different places and introduced me to people and uh, and when they asked if uh, he knew any bass players, he said, well, I know this one guy, but he's a kid, but I think he can do it. And so um, kudos to him um, because he brought me in and um, we went on from there. That's terrific. Uh, now, as I understand it, you weren't a gospel group. The uh, concept of the unit when you first started writing and began to record was that you were basically a folk, folk slash pop group. Correct, correct. Yeah, we were we were all over um, Crosby, Stills, Nash, the band, uh, that ilk, and um, so when they came to us with um, "Put Your Hand in the Hand," um, we just said, "Well, sure, we're not really." Um, worried about the content, this is someone that's inter interested in us that is suggesting that we record this song. And we were recording other songs as well, but they said, you really want to jump on this, let's do this. And of course that is a double-edged sword, because right. on the one hand, you had the biggest hit. Right. On the other, you were sort of falsely categorized in the God Rock group. Sure, people were, um, you know, uh, baptizing their children and each other in the waters of Lake Michigan. And uh, yeah, it, it was quite a thing. And then um, when they would come to see us, and yes, we'd play that song, but we were playing like some harder edge material as well. And it was a little incongruous, but uh, but at the same time, I mean, the song was so iconic that really it brought so much joy to so many people that 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 was the important thing really so you were a very young man basically 16 years old when you joined the group yes tell us a little bit about how you got when the group got signed 
Um, okay, not not long after um, we started uh, uh, rehearsing in this house in Asian Court, we we uh, lived in this place. It was great. That was so suburban back then, and uh, and we had a you know rehearsal spot set up in the garage, and we used to bang around in there. But uh, at any rate, what what happened? The the signing was uh, as often happened with young bands back then. Um, the record company guy, and I'm not likely to use his name, um, uh, went and basically said, I really want to record you guys. I think it would be great. Um, and there's a song that I think would be a great song to, to lead off with. And I have the studio pulls out of the drawer his standard contract. They signed it. I wasn't even of age to sign for myself, but I was trusting my friends who trusted this person, and um, we went ahead. So it was basically just there was no negotiation. Later in life, we all learned how to get a lawyer, look at the contract, Put something in it for yourself, protect yourself in some way, you know, spend money and time doing that. We never did in that day. It, and no, you know, most of the people that I know of in the day, that's what it was. If somebody offered you a deal, you just jump. You signed it and you get in the studio as quickly as you can. And that's basically what we did. Right. And so uh, where did you record this album? Uh, it was Toronto. It was called Ahead Music. A head corporation was, I guess, the the company that uh, owned uh, Yorkville Records uh, that the records were released on, and um, they had a studio that was in the um, industrial area, you know, uh, kind of Pape and O'Connor area. <laughs> uh, and uh, that was industrial at the time. At that time, it was yeah. There was um, a lot of factories back in there. And they had a studio back there, and that's where we went. And um, we went most days for a month and just worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. And you were, you were writing uh, your own material, but from the looks of the tracks that wound up on here, most of the uh, material you were actually recording were, were copies, were written that, by other that's people. Right. The, the, first, the first record, we didn't, uh, none of the things that we were writing uh, made it. Uh, we were trying to figure out who exactly produced this album, and lo and behold, we discovered that you have a credit for production on this. I do? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, I would have said Greg Brown, but apparently it says Greg Brown and the members of Ocean. Well, that's terrific. So, yeah, because there was no producer per se uh, in the studio with us and and Greg basically as band leader music director uh, took the reins but we all contributed in our way and uh, just it was a collaborative effort as a lot of our work was then so you release the album but you're still gigging around as basically a folk group yeah. uh, gigging around locally yeah yeah uh, mostly southern Ontario um, Northern Ontario. And then suddenly, put your hand in the hand hits. Right. And it almost immediately goes to number two on the Billboard charts. Where it stayed for a number of weeks because uh, <laughs> Three Dog Night had Joy to the World and it stayed there for whatever amount of weeks. And we never bumped Joy to the World out of number one. How did that feel? <laughs> that well, must I, have been... Uh, I heard Chuck Negron sing that song this summer, and I still don't like it. <laughs> Something tells me you never will. <laughs> never will. It, it actually wasn't my favorite song d just because of the childlike lyric content. But, um, yeah, but I guess in the back of my craw was still that it would have been nice to have gotten to number one on Billboard. But, uh. but you did wind up doing some pretty amazing touring. Yeah, the, the touring um, was pretty extensive. Um, we, we went to Europe. Um, we did uh, a lot of, of uh, North America, the United States and Canada. 
uh, we went to Japan and the Philippines. Wow. Um, Okinawa, Taiwan. Uh, we, we played over there. Um, Nam was wrapping up. But the war was still on. We played a couple of send-off parties um, for uh, American forces in Philippines. Those were interesting. You must have thought you'd really landed in the pot of gold. Absolutely. And I thought, oh, this seems pretty easy, doesn't it? Right? Like, I think I can do this a few more times and retire by 30, can I? And what amazed me, too, um, when we spoke to uh, Blair from the Jitters, yeah. he was talking about the length of time it took from basically concept to recording. It was about five years. Your band had this number one hit uh, and two albums within about two. But yeah. I think it was sort of yeah. two quick years and yeah. gone. Yes. Imploded. Yes. Yes. It's very quick. <laughs> I, I just I'm trying to wrap my head around it because, like I said, we're we're the same age, and so trying to wrap my head around how I would have felt right. in that situation, and I don't know if I would have been as cool as you appear to be about it. Well, I, I don't know that I am or was, but but uh, I do know that after the second um, record, which we had a lot of hopes for, and and um, was more uh, ourself, it um, it went up the chart fairly quickly and then went down fairly quickly because there was a lot of hanky-panky going on up top above us. Ah. And we got basically, anyway, that's maybe a story for another time. So the original album was on the ARC slash Yorkville yes. label, which of course uh, is now considered a rarity. It's right. one of the more collectible. Right. Um, the, I, and it was released um, in, on Kama Sutra in the U.S. Yes, that was the sub deal that the people at Yorkville um, organized for themselves uh, in order to have the record released in other territories. Um, it was um, released by Kama Sutra. So the first album featured a photo of the band. Very nice, uh, kind of strangely located on that, actually. Uh, but uh, the second one is a concept, a concept uh, photo. Yes. yes, And when I saw that, I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Was that was that deliberate, the, the change in the, the sort of the branding of, of the time? Um, no, I mean, the, the first one was really... Uh, at the whim of the of the record label, as most things were in those days, and we didn't actually go to that location that you see on the cliff there. The, that was probably um, in Ronnie Hawkins' cabin at his <laughs> Mississauga property, and then they took that and they were unable to Photoshop at the time. Whatever they did, they dropped us on to this beautiful landscape. So what was it like the very first time that you heard your song on the radio? There you are. Were you in a car? Were you in your room? You know, it, it's, uh, I can remember it pretty well. We were in our station wagon. We had a station wagon that we used to drive to gigs. Um, and, and the reason, one of the things about doing the recording in the first place was we were playing high schools and community centers and earning a, a certain amount of money for doing so, 500 bucks, say. Um, and by doing this record, we were hoping that we could get modest airplay in our region and up that local price to maybe 750, right? <laughs> that was what we're thinking. We're like, that would be great. And then, so we're driving to some place in Marmara or picked in or someplace and we're in the car and hand in the hand comes on the radio and we're like whoa this is great this is really great and it's probably gonna help us get to that 750 number it's gonna be amazing and uh yeah it was a real thrill i mean that was the first time that any of us had ever heard any music that we were ever involved with on the radio and um, within very short order it was on a lot on a lot of stations and 
the gigs started coming and they were more than 750 and um, they were more than just in our territory. So yeah, it was, it was quite a moment and it, and it happened really quickly. So there you are, young man, first professional gig, and you're walking into the studio. How did that feel? Well, it was really interesting because, uh, like I said, it was in this um, uh, industrial area of East York, and you drive out there and and you go in and there's a, a the engineer was a, a British guy named Frank Burton, and I'll never forget him. He was excellent and very fatherly and very British, uh, but very um, uh, precise about his engineering techniques and learned really a lot from him and we brought our sound man who assisted him and um, the the thing that I remember most about doing it you know we were basically singers the three of us are basically uh, singers and and players so when we we're cutting the basic track though I'm young and I've been practicing scales like um, mad because I was told by people older than me when I first started trying to be a professional and first got involved in this band, you better just practice your scales and get very proficient on your instrument. So that's what I had been doing. And so I could fly. I could play very freely. And I remember starting out like that and then having the engineer say, you know, it would be more effective if you play it super simply. Just dumb it down, make it as oomp, oomp, oomp as possible, and it's going to translate better. And it really, uh, it was a moment because um, it was true. You know, I, I added my flourish where I could, but Really, uh, I learned that the the fundamental purpose, fundamental, you like that, uh, of the bass, um, really is to to hold that, uh, be that tie between rhythm and melody, and it needed to be more consistent and even and simple, and then it can be heard more up front, and that's what I went for. And I have a couple of bass player friends who, when I asked them about this particular song, put your hand in the hand, they said, that's a bass song. They, it, they defined it as as the bass playing the most definitive role in the song. So you did something right there. Yeah, I guess I lucked out. I mean, a lot of stuff, that, you know, when you're that age, you know, it's not like I had a grand plan. I, I came in and tried to do the best I could. When we were talking a little earlier, you mentioned that... Uh, this particular studio didn't have a separate mastering uh, office that you would go to. Rather, they had basically just another room that you would master the, the professional finish. Product. I assume so. I, I assume so because we really, you know, it's not like in uh, later years where artists really did take part in the whole uh, process after the, the final mix um, and, and follow that through the mastering and, and try to get the best guy, the best facility. They had a shop in the back and they made an acetate, which is the first vinyl uh, record that from which they print the rest. Right. They did it all in house there and that's the way it went. You never, We never went back there, we never saw it. So that that was the first album, mm -hmm. and uh, the process with the with the estate. Now the second time you went in, you were coming off a major hit, a world tour. Yes. How did it feel the second time you went into the studio? Were you now really blasé about it, or did, was there still sort of a a high? Oh, I'm never blasé about going in the studio. There's always a high. Um, I've been a, a number of times now, and it uh, that buzz doesn't go away. Um, you, you just want to um, do your best and because you know that it's possible that this will be out there and listened to for years. Not everything is. Some of it is long forgotten. 
and rightfully so. <laughs> <laughs> but you had a stake in it, too, because on the second album, you actually had the lead song on side one, Things I'm Going Through. Yes. Yeah, yes. so that would that must have that would have changed your perspective a little bit, I would think. Yeah, it that's was, your baby. It, yeah, I I had a song and they felt it was a strong song and um, and, and uh, Greg had a, a song on there that was a co-write with with someone and um, so we were getting some of our work through. It made us feel great, and and now that we had toured and had some success. We had more knowledge when we went back in the studio, and and we were more interested in trying different things and different instrumentation a bit, and and uh, finding things that that suited the the, the piece. So it was it was a, a a major change in attitude, more than likely. But uh, but unfortunately, it seems the band didn't last terribly long after that second album. Right. Well, the second album uh, went. Uh, up Billboard pretty well. I think it only got though up to like 70 or 60, but it went really fast in the first two weeks on 100 and then was gone. Um, and basically we came to find out after the fact that um, whatever deal had been cut with Kama Sutra in the US, there was side deals going on, there was shady dealing, and no one wanted to know us. Whatever grass had been cut by whomever, it reflected badly on us. Oh my. And um, with that record was gone in no time. But luckily for you, you did go on to so many other well, recording and, and And I have to, I'm, I'm gonna add to that, that we continued to perform and to write until 1975. Oh, this so several 1972, years. This was 1972, and we were too stupid to quit. <laughs> and we just continued to try and, and, and make demos and write music. And, and you know, and we, we had music from Joe Brown, uh, a couple of songs from him that we thought were, were great. Um, we couldn't get arrested. Um, we, we just were banging our head against the wall because the name had been dragged through the mud. Oh, that's so and, sad. Uh, so we spent about three or four years still slugging it out and wondering why we couldn't gain any traction. Oh, been there, done that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really sad. The next um, band I played in was Ronnie Hawkins Hawks. Right, that's right. And that must have been He, he actually, um, I have a, a great... Um, uh, memory of this, we were sitting, Greg Brown and myself, uh, in a hotel in Brockville, Ontario, where we had, with the rest of the band, decided that day that we're beating our head against the wall, let's pack it in. We'll honor our commitments coming forward, but that's the end of Ocean. And we sat there, and it was sad. And then he and I were sitting in my room talking about how sad that was, apart from the others. And my phone rang. I pick it up, and it's Ronnie Hawkins. <laughs> and he says to me, you know, I, I, don't know, I don't know what you're doing, young Jeff, but I was wondering if you wanted to play bass in my band. And, and what's that, that keyboard fellow that plays with you? You got Greg fellow from London. What's he doing? If y'all boys want to come with me, he said, I, I can't afford to pay you much, but you're going to get more pussy than Frank Sinatra. <laughs> Every Ronnie Hawkins story always, always goes there. He said that to, to Robbie <laughs> Robertson. He said that to Rick Danko. He said that to anyone that played in his band. And he was apparently right. <laughs> maybe, maybe. It must have been interesting. I, I never, I never knew what Frank Sinatra got. <laughs> <laughs> but it must have been interesting too, because you did, you recorded several Robert Robbie Robertson songs um, yeah. in Ocean. Yeah. So of course he would have been long gone. He would have been with Dylan at this point then. Robbie Robertson. Yes. Would have been moved well, on but to... the band, 
the band was still um, active, and um, and we just loved those songs. We just loved those songs. Who didn't? So we just decided to play play them. So, uh, so then you're with the Hawks for roughly a year. A year, yeah. and then the Stingery. Yes, and um, Bernie Labarge. Yes, Brian fabulous. Too Loud McLeod. Yes, who was then plucked away and and went to, to Chilliwack. Chilliwack. Yeah, right. And then and then the Infidels. No, and then Red Rider. Red Rider. My goodness, we're going to have to have you back because there are just too many albums that we would like to hear more about. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today. This has been Off the Beaten Tracks. I'm Roxanne, and I have been talking to Jeff Jones from the band Ocean. Thanks for joining us today. If you hold a hungry, rabid wolverine next to your ear, you can hear an idiot screaming.